So this is Tim Wendelbo, everybody. If you didn't know or you forgot, he won the World Barista Championship in 2004 and World Cup Tasters Championship in 2005 and owns a cafe and a little roastery in Oslo, Norway called Tim Wendelbo. And we were lucky enough to have uh, Tim join us three years ago um, in Paris. If any, some, I know a few people were, were there um, to talk about a new project he'd begun in Colombia um, the farm Finca El Suelo, um, which is a parcel of land that he was then in the process of purchasing from Elias Roa, who is uh, the farmer of Finca Tamana, if any of you guys know that farm as well. And he's back today to update us and, and give us more information and talk about the challenge, the challenges of being a biological farmer. So I'll let you take the floor, Tim. Thank you. This is going to be a lot of information. Uh, this is me. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of information very fast. So uh, at the workshop afterwards, I will go much more into detail what biological farming is and so on, so you can actually learn. So if you have questions that you don't understand what I'm talking about, I'll try to answer them later. So just to give you the first big challenge of being a bio biological farmer is actually I don't live in Colombia. My farm is down here in the mountains down here, uh, close to Neva, and it takes me about 24 hours to go from, from when I leave my apartment until I'm on the farm. Uh, so obviously, I'm not there every day. Uh, I try to go there four to five times per year, and I'm there maybe two to three weeks at a time. So that's the biggest, by far, the biggest challenge that I have at the moment. Um, I'll just briefly explain to you how biological farming works. Uh, it's actually just using nature as it was intended to be done. Uh, you have any kind of plants uh, producing photosynthesis, and with that photosynthesis, it produces sugars that it leaches through its roots to attract bacteria and fungi. The fungi eat the sugar, uh, they uh, keep nutrients in their body, they can actually mine phosphorus and nitrogen and so on from the soil. Any soil, doesn't matter. And then it attracts bigger animals such as nematodes, beetles, uh, amoeba and so on, and they eat the bacteria and fungi, but they don't want all the nutrients that are in the bacteria and fungi, so they poop out some minerals, and that's when the plant can suck up of those minerals and get fed. So this is how nature feeds itself. And if you don't believe that this is true, just look at any forest or any you know, tropical system or any plant in the universe. Uh, most of them aren't fertilized by human beings, but they grow like crazy. So of course, nature knows how to feed its own plants. The, the benefits of biological farming is higher yields, so a farm that has a good soil with good uh, organisms should be able to produce a lot more than any other uh, conventional farm. This is because the plants are fed all the time, 24-7, with all the nutrients that it needs, not just the NPK that the people are putting on. Uh, and because of this, you should be able to have higher quality and more taste. Uh, lower cost because you don't have to buy fertilizers or pesticides. The only labor is to make compost, so the, the costs are actually the labor. Um, because microorganisms create uh, structure in soil, you have more air pockets in the soil, so it works more or less like a sponge. So when it rains, the soil is able to hold water in a much better way, which makes it more robust for drier periods. Um, carbon storage is a thing that is major. We could store a lot more carbon in our soils if we had more fungal biomass in our soil. Uh, because the fungal biomass is mainly made out of carbon. So that means the tubes that the fungus is creating to create structure in the soil are made of carbon. But the problem is we put salts on our uh, crops and we kill the fungus so there's no fungus left in the soil. So that means we can reduce the environment, environmental impact of farming on a big scale, but also on a small scale. We don't pollute water, there's no leaching of nitrogen into water, we don't use pesticides and fungicides, so we don't pollute the environment, which also means the health of the workers is much better. We don't need to wear masks when we are farming. So let me just tell you how, uh, what I've done on the farm so far. Uh, when I bought the farm, which was in 2015, uh, officially, but I started working there in 2014, 
the land looked more or less like this. It was a grassland that had been uh, grazed by some cows. And you can see the waves uh, in the kind of soil have some kind of waves. And that's actually erosion, because when it rains in Colombia, it rains a lot. And there's a compaction layer here because the soil is not protected with trees and organic material. So uh, compaction layers makes the water kind of slide down the hill and takes the soil with it. So it's pretty, pretty bad soil. It's actually more dirt than it's soil. Today it looks like this. Uh, and this is one of my biggest regrets, is that we cut down all the trees before we started to plant coffee. And this was based on some recommendations from Elias, the farmer that is my neighbor now. Um, uh, he said it's better to plant the coffee and then plant the real shade trees to grow with the coffee. Obviously, that didn't work so well. Uh, if you look on the, in the soil, on the soil in the microscope, this is what it looked like when I started farming, which means it doesn't tell you anything. I'll talk more about this later, but um, the particles you see are basically mineral particles, and there are some bacteria that you can barely see. For instance, uh, these little circular things is bacteria. And this is a very, very poor soil, doesn't have the organisms that we need in order to grow plants in a healthy way. This would be an example of very good soil, where you see the, the kind of hair thing here is a fungal strand. You see this uh, little egg-shaped animal is an amoeba that eats bacteria and so on. You have lots of aggregates of bacteria, lots of organic material and so on. So this would be a healthy soil that plants could grow very fast in it. This is actually a sample of my compost, so uh, this is what I want my so soil to look like. So let's see what I've been doing so far. I started in 2014, even before I had purchased the land, to plant seeds, because I expected the land to be mine within the next year. So we started planting seeds. I planted geisha, uh, planted some typica, and we planted the traditional Colombian variety, katura, to see if we could uh, succeed in biological farming. Uh, we needed to plant not resistant varieties to see how they cope with leaf rust and so on. So that's why I chose these varieties, also because of quality. Then uh, we started cutting down all the trees that were on the farm. A lot of them are not so good as, as to use as shade trees because they don't have foliage all year round. So in some sense, it makes sense to cut them down and plant better varieties. But we should have kept the, the ones that were nice. So it basically meant that when we started planting, the soil or the land looked like this. Uh, not a lot of organic material on the farm, and also a lot of weeds growing, which is, you know, I should probably call myself a weed farmer more than a coffee farmer, because that's what's growing on my farm at the moment. Uh, you could really tell that the soil had problems, because it was rock hard. Uh, even the places where you had good organic material, uh, we still needed to use machines in order to make holes that are not even more than 30 centimeters deep. So that means the soil is very compact, and you can see around there, there's not a lot of good organic material. It's just a little bit of grass growing and weeds. So not a lot of accumulation of organic material. Then we started planting in uh, 2015, in the beginning. Um, uh, we planted around 8,000 trees, uh, mainly the typica and the geisha. And a little bit later, we also planted the, the katura. And we also planted the uh, uh, shade trees, uh, probably 300 shade trees. Most of them are now dead, so we have to plant a lot more. Uh, see, this clicker is not working so well. I was also making uh, what we call compost tea, which is basically a brew of compost. Uh, if you don't have a lot of compost, you can make these kind of teas. And then spray it. I sprayed it all over the land because I wanted to kind of recover the soil on my whole farm. Uh, I didn't make my own compost at this moment, so I had to buy some vermipost from uh, local farmers. And it ended up, when I looked at it in my microscope, it was actually not very high quality compost. So, you know, when you buy compost from other people, you have to be very careful because it can be a really bad compost with the wrong set of organisms for your soil. So, at the end of the year, I had 8,000 trees planted in a field that looked more or less like this. To me, this looks very dead. It might look green and beautiful to you. Um, and then I started learning, uh, I started taking a class in the early 2015 about soil biology, and I started to learn how to make compost, and at the end of the year, I finally could make some proper compost, which uh, takes a lot of time. Um, 
it takes at least two to three weeks to make a good compost actively, and then it will take another couple of months before it's ready to be used. So this was kind of the problem. I, I should have taken the classes you know, two years before I even started with the farming and make compost and plant shade trees before I even started planting coffee. At the end of 2015, this is how my coffee trees were looking like. And you can see the leaves are very yellow, which is a clear sign that they're missing nitrogen. Uh, which is funny because we also analyzed the soil in a chemist lab and it said we have a lot of nitrogen in the soil. So go figure, it doesn't work. So the lessons learned during this uh, first year is uh, obviously I learned about soil biology. I was not really sure how to start my farm. I don't know anything about farming. So I was thinking, you know, maybe I should do a combination of uh, conventional or mineral fertilizer with some organic practices. I don't really know. But after I learned about so soil biology and how it works, I mean, once you learn that, there is no way back to mineral fertilizer, that's for sure. I learned that I had to make a lot more compost than I am at the moment. And also, I learned how to gather material for the compost, because in Colombia, it doesn't rain all the time, it's sunny sometimes, weeds grow at certain times, so you kind of have to start planning when to gather the material for the composts. So the following years, 2016, uh, at the beginning of the year, this is what my some of the best coffee trees look like. And as you can see on the soil, there's not a lot of organic material. It's quite bare. You can actually see the brown color is actually the dirt. Uh, so there's nothing holding uh, moisture. Uh, there's not a lot of plants that can feed organisms. So this is not a very good environment to grow organisms. So it's looking kind of miserable at this time. A lot of leaf rust, you can see the orange dots are leaf rust. And if the, the majority of the trees didn't have leaves at all. This is one year after planting them. Uh, but I'm optimistic, so I think, you know, I can fix this. So we started uh, replanting more. Uh, we had some fresh uh, seedlings uh, left over. So we planted another 1,000 trees, which means, in theory, we should have 9,000 trees at this moment in 2016 and so on. I started planting beans around on the whole farm. We started planting perennial peanuts because this is a leguminous plant that spreads aggressively. Unless your farm is full of weeds, then they don't really spread at all. And we planted yucca to try to create some more activity in the soil. We just planted whatever we could find that is common in the area. The problem is I had eight leaf cutter ant nests on the farm. And these guys love perennial peanuts. They love beans. They love anything that is a good plant. And they take those leaves into their nests and they actually farm a fungus so they can eat the fungus. So they, these are really, really difficult to kill. And just to give you an example what they can do, I planted this citrus tree three weeks ago, the day after it looked like this. So they can take out the whole farm very, very quickly. So I quickly learned I need to deal with the ant problem. But because I'm a biological farmer, I can't really use the poison that is normal to kill them. So uh, I learned how to do it the biological way, which is actually brewing a compost tea, putting some Bovaria spores, which is a fungus that is normally used in coffee uh, against Broca, the coffee berry borer. But we can also use them for any soft-bodied insect. So you have to brew it with these spores, and then you pour a lot of it into the nest of the ants. And then a couple of days later, they're gone. It makes the, it, the fungus actually attacks the ants and kind of consumes it. Um, still, we were uh, spraying a lot of compost extract because at the end of 2017 is when I started to get enough compost to be able to put compost out on the trees. Uh, so since I didn't have enough compost, you can also just extract the organisms from the compost into water and spray them on the land. So this is a much more efficient way of doing it. Um, the only problem is that I'm not doing it enough. So I didn't really see the results that I was expecting. So I actually went to uh, Elaine Ingham's uh, um, research farm in California. Elaine Ingham being the guru of soil biology and also the professor that I have learned everything from. And she has trainings where I could go and uh, do practical work for five days. And this was hugely 
uh, informative because theory is one thing, but to actually see stuff being done uh, practically on a farm in, on the scales you need is a whole other level, you know? Uh, I'm not a farmer, I've never grown anything before I started growing coffee, so for me it was a very, very steep learning curve. And she taught me that, you know, you'd need to just make much more compost and much better compost. But it's not like we need, you know, tons and tons and tons of compost. If the compost is really good quality, you don't need that much, and you can also use these kind of extracts to, to apply them to the farm. So this is definitely doable for, uh, for the farm of my size, which is seven hectares at the moment. After I went to Elaine Ingham, I also got some tips that uh, planting sunflower is a good thing because they have a very strong taproot. We could try to break up the compaction layer in the soil and so on. So we planted uh, probably 10,000 seeds of sunflower and none of them came up because I have too much weeds. And at the end of 2017, um, my best trees look like this. This is one of my typical trees, and this is the one geisha tree that looks great. The other ones I will not show you at the moment. <laughs> so the lessons learned in uh, 2016 and 17, uh, I need to have much more plants in general in the soil to, in order to kind of uh, boost the organism population. I definitely need more shade trees, because coffee plants, as you know, doesn't like full sun. Uh, so we're actually planting over a thousand shade trees this year in a very, very small area. But I'd rather plant too many and then cut them down than not having enough and then wait another five to ten years before they grow up. Mulching is important on my farm because we had two years with very, very dry weather. So almost no rain for three months in June, July, August for both years. So no water. And when you have young trees, uh, they don't want to grow without water. So mulching actually means to put some organic material around the tree to preserve moisture in the soil. And this also lowers the temperature in the soil so that the trees are not too stressed. The problem is that I was mulching in the wrong way before and now I've kind of learned how to do it and I'll show you a little bit later how that looks like. Cleaning weeds is also really important. I thought, you know, having plants in the field is great, but weeds are very aggressively growing uh, plants. They have very shallow roots and they take up a lot of the water. So you really need to clean around the trees in order to make them grow, uh, grow fast. And I also learned how to make good compost tea, which I'll explain in the workshop what it actually is, but I wasn't making good quality compost tea, which meant when I sprayed it on my trees, it didn't really have an effect. Timing is also crucial. So over the last three years, I've learned that going to Colombia in June and applying compost and all these kind of things does not have an effect at all because it doesn't rain. So if there's no rain, the organism goes to sleep and there's no effect from it. So you really need to time it according to the weather. So I have a weather station on my farm that I follow every day. We record and then I can see you know, what time of the year is best to come. And also from experience, when is the best time to come and make compost and so on. So let me show you what we've done so far or I've done so far this year because it's mainly been me working this year. Uh, this year I planted another 400 geisha trees, but we lost a lot of trees, so it means in total now we have 600 trees. How do I know? Well, I counted every single one of them three weeks ago. So from 9,000 trees, we have 600 trees. It's mainly new trees that I planted, so the 400 trees, and there's some other scattered around the farm. But now the farm looks like this, where you can clearly see all the round circles are where a tree is planted. Uh, we started planting row crops, so something in between the rows of coffee, uh, like clover and so on, to, to produce nitrogen, but also to preserve uh, moisture and also try to, to create some shade. So I'll show you the way we mulch now. The problem with the mulching, so this is just wood chips that we buy at the carpenter's uh, uh, workshop and we put them around the trees. The problem, wh what I was doing in the beginning was that I put it too close to the tree. So here you can actually see the roots of the tree. If you put the mulch too close to the stem, the roots will actually grow into the mulch instead of downwards where the water is. So the problem is then when you have dry weather, the tree dies. So now we have a much better way of mulching and we put much more on. 
And you can actually see some fungus growing in the mulch, this being a little mushroom, which is the fruit of the fungus. This is a sunflower and clover grown together in the rows. So sunflower, because it has a deep root to break up the compaction layer. Uh, clover to produce nitrogen, because it's leguminous. We also planted the uh, trefosia and pigeon pea, which are shrubs that don't need a lot of water, and they grow fast and then create uh, temporary shade for the coffee trees in between the rows. And it's also leguminous, so it produces nitrogen. The good thing about having only 600 trees is that I don't need more than two buckets of compost extract and tea to treat the trees properly, whereas before I needed, you know, uh, 10 buckets or something, and it just takes me half a day to a day to, to apply to the whole farm. I also have seen results with the compost teas that I had trees that uh, had leaf rust when I came uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and then I immediately went out to spray with some compost tea, and after three days, the leaf rust had died. You can still see the leaves are damaged, but there's no more active leaf rust. So the lessons learned so far this year, I learned how to deal with the ants properly. Uh, I learned the importance of having row crops, and also which row crops to grow, because every climate, every environment is different, and so on. Uh, I started treating the farm more as an orchard, so I'm thinking of it more like an apple farm or an almond farm rather than uh, a carrot or potato farm, if you understand what I mean. So one tree is kind of placed there and we have to treat the area around it instead of trying to treat the whole farm. It makes it much, much easier. I learned how to mulch. I need to make better compost. I finally understood how to do it in a short time uh, because this takes some practice. And I'm also managing the farm every week. Even though I'm in Norway, I can manage through WhatsApp and Facebook, communicate with Elias and his team and say, OK, this week you need to apply compost extract, blah, blah, blah. Please send me photos so we can see what needs to be done, and so on. So we're applying uh, compost extracts almost every week at the moment. Has it worked? And I'll show you a little bit more of this later. But we managed to, to actually grow uh, the fungal biomass in the soil a little bit, but it's not nearly enough. So still the plants are struggling a lot. Uh, we also managed to increase the bacteria population, but also we have some more of the animals eating the bacteria, which is the, what you really need. But we're not nearly enough. This soil is great for growing uh, broccoli, but not for coffee. So just to show you some photos, this is uh, my plantain. It's four years old. Uh, it's not very impressive. But at least now I can see, after I started mulching and clearing weeds, it's growing a little bit better. Uh, these are some of my shade trees. They're not too old yet. Uh, the problem is they get eaten by ants all the time, so they have to start over every year. Uh, this is uh, some of my typica trees. That's my beautiful geisha tree. This is a katura tree that is growing in shade, so it's growing, it's much greener and nicer. This is one of our newly planted geishas, so they are about uh, 14 months old from seed. These are the typicas that I planted in 2015. Here's another one. Here's another one. And these are Elias's geisha that he planted at the same time in 2015. He has a harvest now. I don't. So why is there no progress on my farm? Well, first of all, you saw the land when I started. Really, really poor soil, so a bad start. We cut down all the shade trees. So it's not soil that I'm growing in, it's more dirt. It's lacking the organisms. Uh, the other reason why it's no progress, I'm a part-time farmer. I actually don't know how to farm, so I'm learning it. This is one of the reasons why I'm doing it, to actually learn. And we had El Nino uh, two years ago, and also the following year, we had even less rain than we had during the El Nino. And of course, you have daily challenges. For instance, last uh, or two weeks ago when I was there, I was supposed to brew compost tea, and then we didn't have electricity for three days. So that means the air pump that I need to make the tea doesn't work. So we have all these kind of small things that occur that you can't really control. The plans for the future. I need to hire someone. This is Diego, a uh, barista in, in Colombia, uh, that I have been training for a couple of years, or even from the start. 
how to do everything. So the idea was to hire him this year to do some work for me. But then he got married and moved to Australia. So that's uh, <laughs> good for him, not so good for me. But I need to hire someone to help me out, to, to be on the farm a little bit more regularly, to make compost and so on. Uh, we're planting new varieties to see if we can have some other varieties that are better acclimate, acclimatized or whatever, adapted to the climate in, uh, in my farm. Most of these have already died, but there are a few that actually are growing quite well that we also know taste pretty good. So, question, when is my first harvest? It was last year, and this, this is my total harvest last year. It was one coffee cherry. And I, uh, I it's a natural. It's still in my office. <laughs> uh, this year, I have four coffee cherries. Here's a picture of three of them. Uh, the last one I can't find anymore, so I don't remember where it is. Uh, but next year, we will maybe have 20 coffee cherries. So the increase is tremendous. <laughs> my expectations uh, in the next couple of years is... Uh, people always ask me, when can I taste your coffee? Well, I don't really know, but I'm hoping maybe in two or three years we will have a small harvest that we can be able to taste. Uh, people also say, you know, how are you able to scale this up? Because obviously I want to grow more coffee than 600 trees. Well, this is perfectly scalable. Like, there are farms much, much, much bigger than me doing these systems already. So it just needs more machinery to make the compost and so on. So, the question I got la yesterday, why am I doing all this? Well, first of all, to learn how to farm coffee. That's the main, that was the main reason why I started this project. And I'm learning a lot, but I'm st I still don't know how to do it. Uh, I also think the way we farm coffee today with mineral fertilizer, pesticides, is not a sustainable way. We talk about sustainability, but it's actually not sustainable at all. It's not good for the economy of the farmers, and it's not good for our environment. So the idea is to learn how to do this as a part-time farmer, and then apply it on the farm and other farms that I'm working with and then hopefully succeed with it, and then start teaching other farmers how to do it. And my goal is to be able to grow better coffee so we don't have to spend so much time on processing and stuff afterwards in order to kind of fix the not-so-good coffee and make it taste a little bit better. I want it to taste great from the moment we picked the cherry, and then we don't have to think so much about the processes and so on. And of course, the ultimate goal is to change the world. So is there hope? Yes, for sure. Look at any forests in the world. They produce a lot more biomass than my coffee farm ever will, and nobody has ever fertilized them, and they are perfectly healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Would you like to join me on the yes. chairs? My guest. Very intimate. Yeah, we'd like to get up close and personal with the speakers. Um, no, thank you so much. And it's really, it's, it's great as well to, I think, really see how difficult this, these things are. You know, dashing all our hopes of becoming coffee farmers tomorrow. I think, uh, I, I mean, for me it's easy because I have a job in Norway that pays my salary. I don't have to make money on the farm. Mm. But uh, for a farmer anywhere in the world, this is much more difficult because if the crop fails, there's no income. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. W one of the questions I think it would be good for you to maybe uh, talk about, uh, like answer is, um, obviously your neighbor is Elias and so you have a direct connection to a very established, very successful farmer. So I was wondering, in given that context, how different are his practices from yours? Obviously, you could probably list off hundreds of things, maybe, maybe, but just as a generalization, is it very, very different or a lot of overlap? Or? Well, the obvious difference is that he's actually producing coffee. Um, and um, he has the same problems as me uh, with some of the new plants, like his Bourbon is not progressing that well, and he gets agronomists from different companies coming to look at the soil, and they all recommend different products, and he applies them, and it doesn't work, and then he has leaf rust. And so, you know, with each system, there are challenges. And uh, I would just say that um, 
uh, for him it's easier to kind of buy his way out of the problem with the fungicides and fertilizer and so on. Whereas for me it's more of a holistic understanding of what's actually the problem and trying to fix it before you have the problems. Um, but um, I would say his, uh, his system is as labor intensive, if not more than mine, because they have to apply, with his Katura for instance, he has to apply pesticides seven times a year now. And it still doesn't have leaves on the plants. So it clearly doesn't work. Uh, but with his resistant varieties, of course, he doesn't have to apply as much and so on. So um, there's pros and cons from both systems, but I think in the next 30 years, uh, his farm will be producing less, and um, if I get my farm to be healthy, I will definitely be producing more. Do you have a bet going on that? You should maybe take No, I have <laughs> a bet with a Kenyan agronomist uh, saying that I will produce more coffee than uh, Elias per hectare uh, or per tree in within five years from the start. So I guess that's uh, two years from now. I'm clearly losing that bet, and uh, I have to buy him a set of golf clubs. And he has a very uh, expensive taste, so... <laughs> the other question I really wanted to ask before we take it to the audience is, um, obviously you've mentioned the success of kind of nature and forests, and wild-grown coffee is, is a concept, and it, it is a product available in different places. Did you ever consider starting your farm on a... On a, in, a f in a forest effectively, or was that not an option for you? Well, to be honest, when I started my farm, I didn't really know how I was going to farm. So I didn't even know anything about soil biology. So the reason why I bought the land that I have was because it was available to me. Uh, it was close to a partner that I trust and have been working with. Uh, he also needed to invest in his farm, so that's why kind of why I offered to buy some land so he could get free up some uh, credit to, to purchase equipment and so on. So it's kind of a coincidence or many reasons why I bought the land. And also, I mean, Colombia has great coffee. And in the area we're in, there's great coffee. So, But obviously, when I'm looking back at it now, I would love to start with a forest uh, because then I would succeed much faster. Uh, but that's also not so much fun. Like, it's more fun to not succeed and learn from the mistakes and having trouble. And if I can succeed with this kind of land, you know, any farmer uh, can do that, especially if you live on the farm. Then you can work every day. Makes sense. Um, I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. Um, any hands? No questions. No. Oh, there we go, from Miha. <laughs> Uh, what are the expectations to produce per hectare on a biological farm? <laughs> well, uh, I don't really know because I don't know any other farmers who are doing it at the moment. Uh, also, I have planted it in a different system that is normal in Colombia. So normally, Colombian farm would be the distance between each tree is between one meter and one and a half. And my trees are two and a half meters apart. Some of them are two meters apart. But uh, you can compare with kilos per tree, maybe. And uh, the average on Elias's farm is around four kilos per tree. And I think I should at least be able to produce the same. Uh, but probably more because I have more distance between the trees. So they get more light, they can grow more, and so on. So it's really hard to say. But I expect at least to be able to produce as much uh, as conventional farms when they are kind of healthy. Uh, once my farm is up and running, but it might take 10 years before that happens. It shouldn't take long. Like, if I was there working every day, uh, it, this could take, you know, two years to establish. Um, but I'm not there every day, so uh, that's the problem. I saw another question over here. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so one thing I learned is it's really challenging what you're doing. Uh, one thing I, I learned in the farm is not to uh, plant coffee in parts where it's grass like this and dry, uh, because the grass is very strong. But I think it works if you do it properly things like you're doing. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you do the compost? Is there any tips that maybe you can give us probably? Yeah, I mean, uh, making there's probably a million ways of making great compost. Uh, I'm using a thermal method, which means the compost gets hot. Uh, and I, we need to get it to high temperatures to kill weed seeds, so we don't spread more weed seeds. 
because I use a lot of weeds in the compost. And also I use cow manure, so if it was a food crop, you would have to get it up to temperature to kill like E. coli, if there's E. coli in the manure. Um, so, but it, the, the, the key is to use uh, different types of ingredients. So for instance, a coffee farm, coffee is a forest plant, and the organisms that are in soils in forests are mainly fungus, like it's fungal dominated soils. Uh, and the grassland is bacterial dominated soil. So I need to grow fungus in the compost to get them out into my soil. So that means I need to use a lot more woody materials such as dry leaves, woody stuff, you know, wood shavings, newspaper, cardboard, anything woody, because that's food to grow, for the fungus to grow. Uh, so it's kind of, a, depends on what you're gonna grow, what you need, to, how you need to make the compost. And I'm making hot piles, which you have to be a little bit more active with, uh, but there's all other ways of doing it as well, bokashi being one, worm compost, and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's a complex question to answer, and there are many, many classes you can take, but I would say the problem is a lot of people don't analyze the compost afterwards. So if you had a light microscope, you could actually look at what organisms are in your compost, and if you did that, you would probably not use a lot of the compost that is available, because a lot of it is just rotten material with wrong sets of organisms that doesn't benefit your plants at all. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of organic farmers make massive amounts of compost to put them out, and they don't see a good effect of it because it's not the, a good compost for the crop that they're trying to grow. I'll talk about, a lot more about that in the workshop, so uh, to explain to you what's or different organisms and so on. Do we have any more questions? Uh, let's go to Laura. Um, you mentioned that you went to see Elaine, a soil um, biologist, and you, you took some classes. Are there more sort of institutions or organisations that are perhaps more accessible to a larger variety of coffee farmers that are offering sort of courses or lessons or instruction in this, or is it quite new? And um, do you find that amongst like local communities and certain origins, there's quite an say, a long-term awareness of these functionings of their soil in their region or that sort of thing as well? Um, well, the class that I took was online, so that's available for everyone. It's not too expensive either, considering what you can actually gain from it. Uh, I would say the, the biggest uh, challenge is that it's in English, and a lot of the farmers, at least in Latin America, don't speak English. Uh, also, her teachings are kind of uh, progressive and kind of new, although it's a lot of other methods like biodynamic and so on are using similar stuff, but not necessarily uh, utilizing scientific approaches like using a microscope just to analyze what you have and what you need and so on. So um, in that sense, her teachings are quite unique, but there's a lot of uh, other uh, courses that you could take, for instance, in permaculture, uh, that are building its uh, science on similar things. Um, I mean, any compost class would be great to take, I think, for any farmer, because uh, a lot of times they would use the pulp uh, that are sitting around on the mill, stinking uh, and rotting, and they will, after the harvest they will take the rotten pulp and put it on the trees, thinking it's high nitrogen but all the nitrogen was lost while it was fermenting. So it's very low nitrogen, actually. So what you actually should do is to dry it as a cascara and then put it on the trees, then you have high nitrogen. But, um, so it's a lot of these things, but I, I actually have tried to find communities in, in my area, and there's almost no organic producers at all. And the ones who are, are actually more kind of what I would call conventional organic, so they buy uh, fertilizers that are kind of doing the same as a conventional one, but it's organically made or, you know. So it's, it's not a holistic approach. But, uh, you know, biodynamic farming, all this, I think it's good to, to learn from other or many different places so you kind of gain a better understanding of what it actually is. But her, Elaine, Elaine's classes are really fantastic. Now, I was taking them when she was recording them, so it took a long time, because we had to wait every week for a new video and so on. But now all the videos are available. And then she has workshops uh, online, 
where you can, you know, you sit, it's kind of like Skype meetings and then you learn, you can have questions and so on. So it's, it's really, really good. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank uh, you. A round of applause. <laughs>